This broadcast of OPF Radio on January 7th of 2013 is about Randy and the Feds. Randy Mack is the guest, and your host is Gary Hunt. Welcome to uh, Outpost of Freedom Radio. Uh, the music you just heard has a significant history. Yankee Doodle was one of the most popular patriotic so- uh, songs of the Revolutionary War. Initially, it started shortly after the French and Indian Wars when the British troops were making, mocking the Americans because they fought behind trees and stones instead of standing like good red British sh- soldiers in front of the Indians. Uh, so it was a term of mockery, and when the revolution began, it became even more popular. It was played in Boston, uh, challenging the the local people to uh, uh, to to intimidate them. And uh, the patriots then picked it up as something that was significant to them. They felt that it was uh, we're just going to turn around on them. So they started their fife and drums. Used to play Yankee Doodle as well. And we all know how that turned out, because in 1781, the song that was played as the British left Yorktown was The World Turned Upside Down. Now, we do have a a very special guest tonight, who you all know and love. But before we get there, uh, perhaps a brief explanation of something that uh, has brought uh, uh, YHTOM radio to OPF radio. A few months ago, we were a few of us were working together to rearrange uh, airing "You Have Tread on Me" radio, uh, getting it back online. One of the players in it was a very significant part of it, and uh, things were coming together quite well. But all of a sudden, something arose about that one individual, and well, he was cast out of the picture. Now, I've felt since Waco that things happened for a reason but when he fell out of the picture there was a whole shift again everything got interrupted but we decided to proceed along the same lines we were going uh but not having another source to uh, host this thing we decided to host it on outpost of freedom so it is outpost of freedom radio now you know randy has been broadcasting uh, to patriots for many years uh i used to broadcast back in the late 90s and early uh 2000s uh, out of Washington on internet radio for about five years, but otherwise I've just been a guest on the program. So these strange set of circumstances have brought together both uh, YHTOM radio and Outpost of Freedom radio, and we're going to take a new approach. If you look over on the right side, you'll see that the next show is going to be specific to a purpose. 
uh, we're going to have we have a, a list of shows uh, prepared, and they're going to be ones of interest to the Patriot community and and all of the members of the You Have Tread on Me team, what we call ourselves, are going to be participants in, in bringing you what we hope will be the best of the internet radio for the Patriot community. This current show, one of the circumstances that we're talking about, however, uh, is, is uh, involves. <laughs> Randy Mack, of all people. Um, on July 20, 2012, Randy received a rather surprising visit from the alphabet agencies of the U.S. government. The visit lasted over three hours, and Randy was telling to me a while back when we were trying to put things together, and I stopped him and said, Randy, this has got to be a radio show. And Randy said, agreed, this is, is going to be a great radio show. So uh, we'll now go on with uh, welcome, Randy. Thank you. Good to be here. It's been a while. I've been kind of offline for many months now. It's kind of interesting being on the being on the broadcast again and uh, being the guest this time instead of the host. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, now we're going to go on to your incident, but there were some things that occurred out there in Ohio prior to July twentieth. Uh, you want to tell us about approximately those? July twentieth. Pardon me? It was July 20th, give or take a day or two, I believe. Okay. What happened prior to that, though? Some things led up to this that kind of gave you an inkling that you might be on the hot seat sooner or later. Well, actually, it wasn't just even here in Ohio. I mean, it, you know, uh, I've been getting calls from people who were, getting, who were being, being talked to by certain alphabet, you know, soup agencies about you uh, and me, actually. Uh, their involvement with those things that... You would say things that I would say, um, their political ideology, so forth and so on. And they would get questioned about their participation with us, their knowledge of us, things like that. You know, uh, fishing expeditions, if you will. And it happened, uh, you know, this has been going on well over a year now here in Ohio. Several people that I had known or, or people that I knew of, they were getting visits, uh, Primarily asking about you yourself. My name was always tossed in there. Um, you know, asking about you know, what kind of individual I am. Uh, am I dangerous? Things like that. And usually there was laughter involved when they asked if I was dangerous. You know, I'd rather be fishing. <laughs> I'd rather be hunting. I'd rather be doing a lot of things than doing this. You know, but this basically, you know, when I started getting, you know, feedback that people were getting visits, and people were being questioned about me. And I, I wasn't overly concerned about it. I was actually kind of upset that they hadn't actually come to talk to me. You know, if you want to know about Randy Mack, come talk to Randy Mack. If you want to go ask a bunch of people, I'll be more than happy to sit down with you and have a many-hour conversation with you about me, my beliefs, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. And that's exactly what happened that day, approximately July 20th. I was sitting down at my computer, and I was reading again as usual, doing research and things like that, trying to actually, I was thinking about trying to figure out ways to get back online and how to get the broadcast up and running. And I heard a knock outside. Now, my doorway opens into like a breezeway type area, and then there's another door there. So the knocking was somewhat faint, so I went outside to pick and see who it was. And I saw two gentlemen knocking on the door right next to mine, which, is an, which was a vacant apartment. So I looked over and said, can I help you? And as soon as I turned, I pretty much had them pegged for what they were. You know, they were government agents, federal agents. And they asked, for, they asked if I was Randy, Randy Mascarenas, and I said that I was. And that's when they pulled out the badges. And I checked their IDs, looked them both over, you know, was thorough in it. I greeted them, I said, you know, how are you doing? What can I, you know, how can I help you? And that's when they came up with letting you know that they were doing a, uh, a feel-good, a feel-good visit, if you will, to get to know me better, to find out who I was and what I was about and my thoughts, and to ascertain if there would be any need for concern about me. I had to laugh about this. Uh, they had asked if they could come in, and I'd already shut my door. 
leading into the house. I was standing out in that little breezeway area. And here in Ohio in, in July, it's kind of hot and muggy. It's Actually, it's very hot and muggy in July. I told him it was such a wonderful day. Why don't we stand outside and talk? And they proceeded on to let me know that, uh, you know, this was under by no means a mind or investigation or anything like this. This was more of just a, you know, get, get, getting to know one, a, one another, uh, a talk, if you will, a very informal talk. Buddy, buddy. Yeah, but oh, that's actually how they tried to play. That's actually how uh, one of the individuals, the lead individual, the second individual really didn't say much of anything. The lead individual, that's pretty much how he played it off. In fact, he let me know that him, he and I had very much the same ideology and about 80% of my beliefs. I was like, well, fine. Then, you know, let's sit down and we'll have a conversation. Let's find out just how close we are. Let's see where that 80% leads us to. So he wanted to basically get to know what I was about, and we started off with a conversation of uh, my broadcasts. And it went right direct. I mean, he pretty much punched right into it, into the beginning. Uh, you know, his main reason for concern was some of the broadcasts I have done uh, with you, Gary, uh, talking about the plan for restoration of constitutional government. And as he was going on, he proceeded to say that there were aspects of it that he had concern with. I went on to explain to him that, you know, what Gary had put together that day came from a conversation asking if, you know, what the Founding Fathers had done in the past could actually work in a modern theater today. I said it was a hypothetical, analytical, and theoretical exercise into a what-if scenario. I said, at first, Gary didn't think it would be possible. I said, well, when you break down what the Founding Fathers did, I said there was basically ten steps. And Gary laid those out. He went on to, his concern, though, was is that what some people present as theoretical, analytical, or hypothetical really are not being pre are presented as such but are not meant to be taken as such. In other words, they're trying to promote an idea, an agenda, if you will. He says, you know... He in Hollywood movies, did he? Uh, you know, hey, we see Hollywood movies all the time about things going on in America that just are not true, you know? I mean, there's all kinds of little movies out there about black ops and the government and assassinations in the government and renditions that the government does. I mean, these things don't really happen in America, do they? Equally hypothetical. Equally hypothetical. So, and I told him about that, and he said, well, you know, this is our concern, though, because there have been people in the past that have done things. I said, I can understand that. I said, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in America that I don't agree with. I said, but my question for you is this. you you say you have done your research on me. I said, so have you listened to my broadcasts? He said, yes, we go well, some of them. I said, then you should know what my stance on this concern about a modern-day revolution in our country is. He goes, well, what you say on the radio, you know, we want to get a feel for what you actually think. I said, well, what I say on the radio is what I think. I said, but I'll clarify for you. I said, I'm not for revolution in this country. I said, I don't want to see fighting in the streets. I don't want to see Americans bleeding on the streets of America, trying to fight for freedom that is their God-given right. I said, the sad thing, though, is that a revolution has already happened in this country. I said, but it's not a revolution that you yourself think has happened. I said, here's the reality, though. I said, we the people are the masters of this country. And our elected officials are our servants that work for us. I said, and sadly, those elected officials have forgotten that they are the servants of the House and not the masters. I said, and they have taken that Declaration of Independence, they've taken those, those ideas of the Declaration of Independence and the laws within the Constitution, and they've subverted them for their own end. I said, whenever they don't like something, the wording of the Constitution, they just cross it out, they make an amendment, they get rid of it, and they proceed as if nothing's happened. I said, and sadly, 
I said it was our duty to make sure that the government behaved. I said, we, have I said we, the people, have failed in that duty. We have not made sure that our government behaves. I said, what I believe in is a restoration of our constitutional freedom. What I believe in is a restoration of the principles within the Constitution itself. What I believe in is a restoration of the Constitution. I said, because right now we are far from living within the spiritual act or the, uh, the spirit of the Constitution, as well as the letter of the law of the Constitution. I said, so if you're worried about people that are rebelling against the, you know, rebelling in this country, I said, you need to go talk to your bosses up in D.C. You need to go talk to the 435 congressmen, the 100 senators, the president, and those nine guys on the Supreme Court. I said, those are the individuals that you should be worried about when you talk about rebellion because they've already rebelled. He was a bit taken back by that. I said, what I, I told him, I said, I would be tickled pink if one day I woke up and those 535 people that are sitting in Capitol Hill, congressmen and senators, the two individuals in the White House, the president and the vice president, and the nine Supreme Court justices have all said, you know what? We have done this country a great injustice, and we have violated the very oath of office in which we took. And as of this day, we're requesting that all 50 states hold special elections to find our replacements. And we would urge them to pick individuals who are well-versed in the Constitution, who understand what the document, what the limitations of the Constitution were, the limits they placed upon government, and the freedoms that were ensured in the very Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. <coughs> I said I would be tickled pink if that happened. I said, but unfortunately, those in power will never give up power. They only seek more and more and more power. I said, so until we the people begin to realize that even the slightest deviation from freedom, even the slightest um, compromise upon our freedom is a loss of that freedom. I said, you cannot be a little bit pregnant and you cannot get a little bit enslaved. You're either 100% totally free or you're not free. And that's what America's facing today. He went on to tell me that, or he went on to ask me, how have we lost our freedom in this country? I said, well, you're on my doorstep. You're on my doorstep right now, investigating me for my freedom of speech and the things that I've, the ideas that I've expressed on my broadcast. And you're concerned about me because of my freedom of speech and my political views. I said, have I lost my First Amendment right? Now, this was a trick question. This was a trick question for him. He said, no, you have not. You have, the, you have the full power of your First Amendment right, your freedom of speech. I said, well, that's funny. I said, because if I go to D.C. today and I will go down there to protest, I said, I have to apply for a permit. I said, and what does that permit, and I said, and what, how is a permit defined in Black's Law Dictionary? I said, well, if we look back, a permit was defined as permission granted by an authoritative body for an individual to engage in something, to engage in an act which would otherwise be illegal. I said, so my request, my, my uh, application for a permit would then state that I am agreed that I do not have the right to protest. I do not have the right for redress of grievance to my government because I'm having to ask permission. And if we look at that First Amendment, I have the right to freedom of speech, I have the right to assembly. I have the right to protest. And if we go on there, it says the Congress can make no law in any way whatsoever that violates that freedom. And the very act of me having to apply for a permit violates my First Amendment. The fact that you're here talking to me about the things that I say, and I have never on any of my broadcasts ever endorsed or espoused violence in America. 
I said, but you're still here on my doorstep talking to me. I said, even the Nazis used to do that. I said, Socialist Russia did that. The Chinese do that. Pol Pot did that very thing. Castro did that. I said, all of these little dictatorships and tyrannical governments throughout the world, this is exactly how they do. They start looking into and investigating people who are saying things that they don't like. I said, that's how tyranny begins. That's when you know that you're, that you're moving into tyrannical state. When you cannot speak your mind for fear of retribution or fear of a visit. I said, the very fact that you're here, many people would get scared by this. I said, I'm not worried about you guys. I said, I do not fear tyranny, and I will be damned if I'm going to shut up and not say what I have to say or think what I have to think or believe what I believe for fear of you coming for me. I said, you know, our founding fathers, they pledged their life, their fortune, and their sacred honor to free a nation, to free a people and create a new nation. I said, can I be expected to do any less? So he asked me how my freedoms had been infringed upon. I said, well, we can just take a look at one little case study. I said, let's look at the Patriot Act. He said, but has that affected you? I said, the very, I said, the very writing of the Patriot Act nullifies the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I said, yes, I've been impacted by that. He goes, but have you specifically been affected by the Patriot Act? I said, if any one single American has been affected by the Patriot Act. And I said, I have read numerous, numerous reports of Americans being renditioned for things that they said, being sent out to Guantanamo and other places and held without notification of the family members that they were being, even being held, without right to counsel. I said, in fact, during these renditions, after they're let go, they're told that they even speak to anybody about it. They can go to jail for a very, very long time. I said, if any single one American has lost any bit of freedom, then I have lost mine as well because it is only a matter of time before we, before th these tactics become the norm. So yes, I have been affected. I said, you want to? I said, but more specifically, you want to ask me how I've been affected by you know what loss of freedom I've had? Let's look at twenty-two thousand plus gun laws on the books. I said that has affected my Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. I said, you know, that Second Amendment is very sacred to me. I said, let me recite it for you in case you're not quite aware of what it says. Or if you've looked on the Washington.gov website for the new wording of the, con of the Second Amendment. I said, but the original Second Amendment states, a militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right, to keep, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I said, now tell me how 22,000 gun laws does not infringe upon my right to keep and bear arms. I got the standard government uh, ploy from him. Well, not everybody should have those guns. I mean, you don't want every pedophile out there and every murderer out there to have guns, do you? This is kind of, you know, this is typical socialist propaganda, tyrannical propaganda. I get it. My comeback was: is what part of infringe do you not understand? One single law. One law, which violates my freedom, has nullified my freedom. I said, in 1968, the Gun Control Act of 1968 was created. That was a massive infringement, and it has only grown since then. I said, and in fact, an entire government organization has been created whose only purpose is to combat the Second Amendment. I said, and you might be aware of this little organization, it's called the BATF. Their only purpose is to infringe upon my right to keep and bear arms. Well, he says, you can own guns now. I said, again, though, I have to ask permission now. I have to apply for a permit. I have to ask permission, and then the government needs to do a background check on me to see if I'm worthy, if I'm trustworthy, 
if they would trust me to own this gun. So that violates the very spirit of the law. I said, you don't have the authority to tell me that I can't own guns. I said, and, you know, you yourself, the FBI, I said, you violate these freedoms of the people on a daily basis. He, I, and then he goes on to say, I do not violate the people's freedom. I said, have you ever been involved in a raid or any kind of uh, an arrest with somebody for possession of weapons? Well, yes, I have, but those were illegally owned. I said, what part of shall not be inferenced did you not understand? That means you can't touch it. You can't mess with it. You can't restrict them. You can't limit them. You can't tell me anything. I said, if I want to have a howitzer in my front yard and an M1 Abram tank parked in my garage, that is my freedom. I said, and we can justify this by looking back to what the founding fathers did when they created this country. I said, you could pull into any harbor out there and you would see ships with cannons. And these were privately owned ships with cannons. Today is the equivalent of a battleship. And they did not tell them, while well, we fought this revolutionary war to create a free country, but now that we're in power, we're going to take that freedom from you. Those people could still have their ships and their cannon. Well, what, and then he went on to proceed with, well, what happens when they start using those things illegally? I so said, then you punish them individually. And you charge them with the crimes that they're guilty of, whether it's murder, armed robbery, or whatever it is. But collective punishment, which you've engaged upon, well, I haven't done that, he says. I said the government then, the federal government, which the federal government has engaged upon is a very socialist idea. And we are not a socialist country. He goes, no, we're a democracy. I said, no, we are not. I said, we're a republic. And there was a huge difference. I said, you, I, I believe you need to go back and reread your constitution. You did swear an oath to it. When you, t when, you became a, when you became a Fed. He said, I actually swore that oath twice. I was in the military. I said, then you swore that oath twice. Are you in a habit of swearing an oath to something that you don't understand? Backpedaling again. Now, I was not being confrontational in any of this you know, discussion. I was very friendly and sociable with them. Are you talking in the same tone of voice that I'm talking to everybody right here. You were educational. What was that? Not, you were educational. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, he said that he said that he's listening to my broadcast, and he agrees with eighty percent of what I got to say. Well, great. I don't have to agree. I don't want him to agree one hundred percent with me on everything that I believe. That would make him just, you know, a victim of brainwashing to my propaganda. I just want him to understand and uphold that oath that he took to defend the Constitution from all threats, both foreign and domestic. Now, what does that domestic threat mean? Yes, it means criminals. It also means anybody who's trying to subvert or destroy the Constitution or my freedoms, which could be politicians, judges, those with power. You know, they say the power of the, you know, they talk about the power of the sword, but the power of the pen is mightier because of the single swipe of a pen. An entire freedom can be negligated, can be wiped out, can be erased. Tomorrow, Congress could pass a law that bans all guns. In fact, they've got a bill pretty much going up there right now, don't they? Trying to ban guns again. They have 10 of them up there right now. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I worry about the criminal with the gun. I worry more about the politician with the pen. So, you know, during this whole thing, you know, I'm not, I wasn't at all being trying to be belligerent or adversarial or even aggressive with them at all. You know, like I've said on my broadcast many times, you know, when people are looking in the chat room and they saw, you know, 20, 30, 40 different anons in there, <coughs> back when the show was really up and pumping out, you know, they would start deriding the anons. I told them to let, leave them be. These people have the right to be anonymous if they want. I said, and, you know, I hope they are feds, and I hope they keep listening. And I said, I hope that 
Every time they listen in, they just take one thing. They just learn one thing from that entire broadcast and just think about it. This is the way we change America back. We get these people to understand the error of their ways and to say, damn, he's right. And not that I'm right, but that they've gone and done the research themselves and they've read it right there. Wow, look at that. You know, Tim, Tim Cox really did say that the right of the, the people to keep in their arms was just not for hunting, but it was for, it was for self-defense of the home. It was for defense of their community. It was for defense of their county and their state and their nation. And not just from foreign invaders, but the worst kind of invaders of them all. Our elected officials who decided to subvert the Constitution, who decided to corrupt their offices and become the tyrants that we worried about. Remember, you know, I'm founding, you know, during the big debates for the revolution, you know, one of the main questions is, why should I replace a tyrant 3,000 miles away with 3,000 tyrants, um, or with one tyrant 3,000 miles away, and replace that one tyrant with 3,000 tyrants a mile away? This was the great fear. Benjamin Franklin was asked, what do we have, a republic or a monarchy? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. Well, who would we keep our rep- how would we keep our republic? By ensuring that our politicians, those elected officials who are our servants, behaved. By Americans being well-versed in that document, and not just that document, but the state document, their state constitution. Because the states were supposed to be the buffer between the feds and me. In fact, I was supposed to have no contact with the feds directly. They would not be able to come talk to me. The state was my, was my authority, was the local authority, the state government. And it was that constitution which I operated under. The federal constitution, that just established a form of government and laid out the limitations of it. And then the, the Bill of Rights just told them, these are the basic freedoms of Americans that you cannot touch. You can make no federal laws which infringe upon these things. But that left it open to the states to decide what freedoms the people had in those states. Most people don't understand this. Now, every state had to supply their own, had to submit their own constitution of creating a republic form of government that had to be approved by Congress. And I've looked through many state constitutions, and I see, and I haven't seen one yet that restricts gun law, or that restricts gun ownership. You know, people in Chicago are screaming because they, cause they don't have guns, and they had, what, 500 murders last year. You had Aurora, Illinois, which is the second largest city in Illinois. Their people are allowed to own guns there, and they had, I think, under 10 murders all year long. Do we see the difference when our rights are restricted? I tried to express this point to him. I don't know if he understood it. But it was interesting because then we started talking about, you know, his violation of people's rights. And I asked him, I said, have you ever arrested anybody for gun violations? He said, yes. I said, have you ever engaged in a SWAT-type raid? He said, well, I've had to. I said... So then I, this again was another trick question. I said, according to the Constitution, I said, how is a warrant lawfully served? And he looked at me, and I think he knew he was caught in my little trap there. I alleviated the, the problem of him trying to have an answer, and I said, I'll tell you how. I said, you being a fed, you're... you're mandated that federal constitution, I said, and you are required to obey it. I said, if you have a warrant to search my property or to arrest me, I said, it has to be, when you present it, it has to be presented to me, and I must be given time to peruse it for validity, that this is my name, this is the address that is on the warrant, 
and that I understand what it's for. You're either searching the property and specifically what you're looking for, or you're there to arrest me. I said, and that is, the proper, certain, that is how you properly serve a warrant. I said, but now when you engage in SWAT-style SWAT tactics, when you kick in the door, start popping out flashbang grenades, and you've got a bunch of guys in black getup, their face is covered with balaclavas pointing true assault weapons at people because yours are full auto, whereas mine is just a semi-automatic. I said, you start screaming to people to get down, get down, get down. I said, that very act alone, you have now violated the people's freedom. I said, you did not serve that warrant lawfully. You violated their freedom. I said, how many times have you done that? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it to me. Think about it yourself. I said, on top of that, any time a warrant is issued, I said, you know, a warrant can, o can only be issued by a grand jury, not a judge. And I said, I've heard lots and lots of stories about your guys' uh, doorstep warrants that you're now writing up, where you guys actually have the authority to draft up your own warrants because you want to come and knock on someone's door and they ask them if they can come inside, and they say no, give a warrant, and you whip out your little notepad and you draft up a warrant right there on the doorstep. And according to you, it's a legal search warrant. I said, it might be legal, I said, but is it lawful? I said, there is a difference. I said, Hitler did nothing that was illegal. I said, every law that he made, he destroyed part of the Weimar's Republic's constitution, much like our government has done, and he created laws that would make everything he did legal. I said, so whether it's legal or not is a not that question. Whether it's lawful or not is. Have you violated the Bill of Rights? He went on to explain that, you know, when he served and he fought to defend that Constitution. You know, he fought for American's freedoms in uh, the Middle East, Iraq, I believe it was. Maybe it was Afghanistan. I forgot which one he said. You know, he wanted to explain to me those type of tactics, you know, the SWAT team entry tactics, kicking in doors, screaming, get down, get down, get down, because when he served, and there was dangerous people behind those doors, and you had to get in quick for the safety of the, of the, of the soldiers, and you had to be fast, and you had to enter quick, and you had to secure an area quick and get those people down on the ground quick and make sure everybody was safe. I said, I can understand that. I said, but when you start doing those kind of tactics on Americans' doorsteps and in their homes, I said, are you now claiming that Americans are enemy combatants? I said, you know, I've, I've heard many former police chiefs, current police chiefs, sheriff, who talk about the dangers of those type of SWAT raids where you're kicking in doors and everything. I said, and many of them are against that type of tactic because it puts everybody in danger. Accidental deaths, um, I said, they abound in your mount tactic training, you know, when you do these mount in entries into homes. I said, on both sides. I said, wouldn't a much safer way to actually arrest somebody if that's what you're trying to do is arrest them be to do a routine traffic stop after they leave their home? Only it's not so routine because now you pull them over, they don't know what it's about. And you let them know, I've got a warrant for you. Here's a warrant. Will you please step out of the car? I said, but instead, I said, we have to get, you know, a bunch of guys decked out in military-style body armor, laser sights on their rifles, flashbang grenades, tear gas, windows being busted out, doors being kicked in. I said, armored personnel carriers that you call door knockers. I said, when did Americans become the, become enemy combatants? He went on to explain that in some circumstances, those tactics are necessary. I then explained several different scenarios that SWAT has entered in. These were all actual events. There was a mayor of a town, small town in Massachusetts. 
UPS delivered a box to him. He's the mayor of this town now, remember that, okay? Mayor of the town. UPS delivers a box to him. Now, the feds have this box marked. When they deliver the box, they leave it outside on the doorstep because nobody's there to take it. Nobody's there to sign for it, so they just leave it there. His mother, his, his mother was, came home. The kids were there and the dogs were there and the wife was there. They kicked in the door. They ended up killing both the dogs, had his mother down on the ground, spread eagle, with a barrel in her face. Kids were screaming and crying. Problem is, UPS delivered this box to the wrong house. There was another couple. I believe they live in Florida somewhere. I forgot the exact town. They're in their 70s. And the police there use a uh, randomized computer system that basically pulls an address out of a hat. And the cops pretend as if they're going to do a raid on this house, you know, with SWAT tactics. The problem is, is that this computer started actually spitting out these raids in real life. This 70-year-old couple had been raided by SWAT teams over 30 times in a year. Doors were being kicked in. And these old people were being woken up at 2 or 3 in the morning with a real assault weapons. Not, you know, assault, not semi-automatics or carbines or anything like that, but true, full military assault weapons. Because of computer errors. They were looking for drugs. You know, uh, some of the scenarios were that these people were high, you know, were big time drug dealers, gun runners. Can you imagine a SWAT team getting a call, getting a raid, getting a raid report out, and they're going to go bust down a big time international gun smuggler? What kind of anxiety level do you think they're going to be at when they kick in that door? For all they know, they could be kicking open that door and they're facing an you know, Ma Deuce 50 caliber machine gun. But it was just two old people in their 70s. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of these. Dogs getting killed right off the bat because these people are kicking in doors at 2 or 3 in the morning and the dogs are in the house. Well, rule one is you put the dogs down. And a lot of times these people haven't done anything wrong whatsoever. And if it ever was, they would really require that kind of a threat response. I'll leave that to the American people to decide on their own. You know, he backed off of that tactic. He backed off of that subject then. You know, he didn't like talking about the SWAT entries and things like that anymore and the fact that I understood exactly how federal warrants were to be served. And, yeah, he, you know, we, we, we left that subject alone then at that point. But what I did go into was the illegality of the federal of the FBI, the BATF, the DEA, and all these other organizations. I said the very fact that you exist, I said it's a violation of the Constitution. Well, what are you talking about? You know, the FBI is needed, the BATF is needed, you know, or the DEA is needed. All these groups are needed. I said, great. If you're needed, then make them lawful. I said, you are not allowed to exist lawfully according to that Constitution right now. Congress was given very specific powers, and police authority was not one of them. I said, for, for you or any other alphabet agencies out there to exist, including the EPA, including HUD, <coughs> you take your pick. I said, an amendment to the Constitution would have to be drafted and ratified by two-thirds of the states in order for you to exist. Has that been done? Last time I checked, it hasn't been. I said, the very fact that you're even out there engaging in policing actions is a violation of the people's rights. Now, I'm not saying that all of your actions are bad. You guys find missing children. You guys break up kitty porn rings. I said, I get it. I said, and thank you for doing those things. I said, but you said that you have not violated anybody's freedoms. I said, the very fact that every time you arrest somebody or go and talk to somebody in an official capacity, you have violated their freedoms because you're not even allowed to exist. 
you're an unlawful organization right now in the, in the U.S. I said, you are that domestic threat to our Constitution because you're acting outside of the government authority. They have no authority for you to exist right now because, well, there's no amendment. I said, so think on that for a little bit as you're telling me that you have not, never violated anybody's rights or freedoms. It was an interesting conversation up to this point. This was about an hour into it now. The interesting thing, though, was that, you know, there was only there was two individuals there, but only one of them was speaking. The other one was standing about two feet to the left and about three feet back. I would assume cover myself if I was, you know, you know, he's going to be cover fire or, you know, a reactionary individual in case I did something stupid, you know, because, well, they don't know what kind of person they're walking in on. And I get that. You know, I'm militia. <laughs> I'm a bad guy, I guess. Although the militia is named in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights each. In fact, federal law says that I must be in the militia if I'm between the ages, and all able-bodied men, men, between the ages of, what is it, 17 and 47, must serve in the militia. That law has never been overturned, revoked, dispensed with. It's still the law. Now, he had served in the Army, and we went on to the militia aspect, by the way, because that's what this whole visit was about, the things I say and the fact that I was in a militia or was in a militia, or currently am in a militia, or whatever he wanted to think that I was. I said, you know, the Constitution also speaks about, the, re you know, who is the defenders of this country. I said, no, the Constitution called for a strong naval fleet to protect our harbors and our shores against foreign invasion. It also required a small contingent of, a small contingent of professional soldiers to be attached to that navy, to act as our, that first line of defense while the militia was being mustered. I said, that would be the Marines, because they are part of the Navy. I said, no, in the Constitution does it allow for the creation of a professional military body, i.e., the Army and the Air Force. He was in the Army. I said, there's a lot of things that our government does that are not lawful, but they do them anyways. I said, you know, I don't have any problem with the, you know, I said, I don't have any problem with the people that serve in the military. I said, they take an oath to protect and defend this country, and I hope they understand what that oath is that they take. I said, anybody that wears a uniform and swears to uphold and defend that Constitution against all threats, both foreign and domestic, I truly hope that they understand what it means. But unfortunately, I have yet to see it from very many at all, because most of you just follow orders and do as you're told. Somebody told you that I needed to be watched, that I might be a potential threat. So you're here talking to me to ascertain what kind of a threat I might be, to determine if I even am a threat or not. Or am I just some 500-pound fat guy who sits in front of my computer all day and really does nothing? No offense to 500-pound fat guys, but you're really not going to start a revolution, which was their concern about me. I'm planning to start a revolution and overthrow our government. I said, you know, you worry about me wanting to overthrow the government, you know, about being anti-government. I said, I am very much pro-government. I am pro a Republican-style government that our Constitution called for. I am pro limited government with limited power. With all powers not specifically delegate or delegated to that government body being reserved for the state and we the people. I said, I cannot imagine living in a society that had no form of government, no laws, where it was every man for himself. Kind of reminds me of the old Viking days. You, know, you kill somebody, all you got to do is pay a, pay a blood price to the family. You know, Vikings went out and pillaged and plundered because they didn't have enough grain to make it through the winter. So spring came and they went on the pillaged and plundered, take it from everybody else. You know, the Aztecs would go out and kidnap people so they could sacrifice them to their gods and, 
you know, for rain or for sunshine or the end of winter or whatever it was that they were praying for. I said, that's not the society I want to live in. I said, what I want is my republic. I said, I'm pretty much happy with that constitution. I think there are some loopholes that need to be filled, that need to be gotten rid of, and some cracks in the foundation of it that need to be filled in, because we've seen how it can be subverted. I said, now that we've seen how politicians will subvert it, we know what to fix in it. I said, but you know, you talk about militias as if they're a threat to this country. I said, if it wasn't for the militia, we would have no country. We forget George Washington. He was the commander of the Continental Army, which was what? The mustard militia of the various states, or the provinces at that time. They were militiamen. Lexington Concord, militia. I said we were all militia at the time. Without a militia, there would be no country. There would be no America. You would have no freedoms in this country except that which England deigned to give you, which were always being, well, taken away at a moment's notice. And if you didn't obey, he sent his redcoats in, and he made you obey, or he killed you. I said, that's the problem, though, is that we have forgotten our history. We have forgotten our culture. We have forgotten a lot of things. That was when he brought up committees of safety. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Because I have, you know, as well as I do, Gary, that you and I have pushed this committee of safety concept for a very long time. You know, and for those who are listening in that don't know what the committees of safety were, think Continental Congress. That was a federal gathering. That was a national gathering of the, of the delegates from the states of the committees of safety. And those states, those state representatives, now, the Continental Congress could not act of, of its own. Those delegates were under orders from their states. They could not do anything outside of what those, what that state that they were from told them was okay to do. In other words, the Continental Congress answered to the states. Now, those state delegates answered to their county delegates, or answered to the county committee of safety. That's who they were chosen from to represent at the state level and the state to the town. It was a very bottom-up organization. Later on, after we established government, the committees of safety changed a little bit. Well, they didn't change. They just took on the authority. They just took on the responsibilities that were needed in the areas that government wasn't providing for. In the Old West, it was against Indian attacks or bandit raids or, you know, whatever it was. You know, uh, whatever it was that this town needed at the time and government wasn't providing for it because until you became a state, well, you really didn't have government. So the committee just said to fill that role again. So they were concerned that these committees of safety were an establishment to overthrow our government and create new government. I said, you know, I said, our Declaration of Independence says that we, the people, have the right to change or abolish government and to establish new guards to preserve our liberties. I said, now, how would we do that? I said, well, the blueprint was already done for us. He goes, a revolution. I said, no. No, 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 no. I said, we started off in the Articles of Confederation. I said, well, that government was not working at all. I said, those the delegates from the committees of safety got together again and established a Continental Congress again. Or well, they established a Continental Congress. And they changed the government to a new form of government, again, yet a republic, that would better ensure life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness, all those good things that were taught as a little kid. Or we should have been taught as a kid. I said, now, how do you think a Continental Congress is formed? Well, it has to come from the body of the people. Well, we're just all going to gather? No, again, we look back to history. And what was it? It was the Continental Congress. It was already had one. I said, no, no. 
That was not a lawfully formed Continental Congress. There was no delegates from committees of safety sent. That was just a group of people who decided with a very few limited number of votes from we the people, in other words, their friends who sent them up there. So that was, a law, that was not a lawful body. And anything they submitted to Congress was not a lawful declaration of we the people. I said, but that's the problem with America today. We don't know our history. I said, and that's what my show was about, trying to reteach, re-educate Americans on our history, on the way that our founding fathers said to correct the problems of this country that they knew would arise. I said, read the writings of our founding fathers. All of the problems that we face in America today, they forewarned us about over 200 years ago. Every single problem we have today, they foresaw. And then you guys wanted, and the government wanted to tell me that our founding fathers never foresaw technology advancing, and now we have bigger and better weapons. But they foresaw every other problem in America. I said, you want to fix the problems of America? Get back to the Constitution. Do what is lawful. Not what politicians want to do, but what the Constitution says they can do, what they have to do. I said, and maybe then we can actually be free. And maybe then you'll actually can say that you are preserving freedom in this country by enforcing the law, actually lawful laws and protecting the citizens. I said, right now, you, you enforce 22,000 gun laws. Right now, you violate people's, people's rights you know, people's right from illegal persecution and seizure by issuance of, of unlawful warrants and the serving of, unlawful, of these unlawful warrants in a very unlawful way. I said, we have politicians that are calling people like me um, uh, what, what, what are they called? Um, Homegrown terrorists, domestic terrorists. I said, you had FEMA going out and teaching some people from various police departments that our founding fathers were domestic terrorists. I said, when I was a kid, we were told that these were American heroes and that without them, we would not have a country. Now we're being told that Washington and Jefferson and Hamilton and Adams and Madison... And so many more were nothing more than domestic terrorists. I said, we had Nancy Pelosi get on stage or get in front of cameras in the national TV and say the greatest threat to Americans was our returning soldiers. Those who were no longer serving. I said, that would be you. Are you currently serving in the military still? No. And Nancy Pelosi was addressing you. You're the greatest threat to America right now. He didn't really know what to say to that. I didn't know what to say to it when Nancy Pelosi said it either, except that it reminded me of what Plato said. Plato said that when you create the perfect dictatorship or tyrannical government, you have two ways to rule, by the sword or by the illusion of freedom. He goes, if you rule by the sword, you have to have huge armies in order to suppress your own people as well as to conquer neighboring countries. He goes, if you rule by the illusion of freedom, you don't have to worry about that because the people believe they're free. But specifically, he said that the problem with ruling by the sword is that all of these people that you have taught how to overthrow other governments, how to take over other countries, well, they know how to take over that tyrannical government in which they're aligned with. And they said that is the great, and Plato said that's the greatest threat that any dictatorship or tyrannical government would have to be concerned about. And Plato was very much a proponent of that elusive tyrannical dictatorship, a rule by the, by the philosopher kings, if you will. They were the behind the scenes ruler, they were the Brzezinski's and Kissinger's. who themselves take orders from others. Then you had a king up front that the people actually believed was king like in Sparta. But Leonidas couldn't do anything until he went to the 
oracles of Delphi. To the priest kings of the oracle of Delphi. Hmm. Was Sparta really not free? And the babies were taken at an early age and cast out if they were not perfect? You tell me, history is ripe with examples that, of Plato's perfect government. He didn't know how to address that either when Pelosi said that he was the greatest threat to America's freedom. We had an interesting conversation for three hours. Most of the time it was me trying to educate them on what the Constitution actually says and what it doesn't say. Well, do you think they actually felt good after you explained all this to them? Well, I kept it out in the heat for three hours. <laughs> they kept trying to leave. They kept trying to leave. You know, they tried to leave after an hour and a half. They tried to cut it short. I wouldn't let them. I kept talking. <laughs> they tried to leave after two hours, two and a half hours. They finally left after three. Did they, uh, did they seem to grasp what you were saying at all, or were they just shining you on and pretending like they were? Do you think you struck any notes on them? Hard to say. Um, I'll tell you a couple of things that, a couple of questions that they asked me. He asked me if they ever came to serve a warrant on me, how I would respond to that. I said, well, that depends. I said, are you going to present that warrant? Are you going to knock on my door politely? Say, Mr. Randy Mascarenas, and I'll say yes, and they say, we have a warrant here. And then you'll tell me what that warrant's for, and you'll hand it to me. You'll let me peruse it to make sure of its validity. I see that it's made out to Randy Mascarenas, and that's me. Yes, it is, and that's my address. Yes, it is, and I understand what this warrant is being served on me for, and what do you know? There's a federal grand jury who signed off on this. I said, if you, are, if you serve that warrant lawfully on me, I would have no choice but to respect it. I said, but, and he knew what my butt was going to be. I said, if you come kicking in my door at 3 in the morning, wearing a bunch of ski masks, dressed in all black, screaming, get down, get down, get down, and never identifying yourself, and never handing me that warrant to review it. I said, well, let me ask you this question. I said, if you had a bunch of armed men kicking your door at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, screaming, get down, get down, get down, and they never identified themselves. What would you do? He said, I would defend my family. I said, so what do you think I would do? He just smiled and nodded at me. I said, that's exactly what I would do. I said, so the question is, is if you ever come to serve a warrant on me, are you going to do it lawfully and be polite about it? Are you going to come kicking in my door at 2 or 3 in the morning? I said, and if you do... I said that I'm going to assume that you're a threat. And here in Ohio, we have this little thing called Castle Doctrine. I said, and if you serve an unlawful warrant on me, and you don't even tell me who the hell you are, all I know is that there's a bunch of guys dressed in black, ski masks, who are waving guns around, telling me to get down. I'm thinking home invasion. I'm thinking criminal. I'm thinking protect my family. You know, I even brought up to him the case of Guerrero down in Arizona. Remember him, the Marine? Jose, yeah. Jose Guerrero. I said, you know, I said, you guys did the same thing to Jose Guerrero. I said, a Marine, fellow, fellow vet. You know, you're kind of guy. I said, his wife woke up to noise outside. She looked out the window. She saw a bunch of guys in ski masks with guns. She woke up her husband, a Marine. I said, he grabbed his rifle, and he crept out the hallway. I said, unfortunately, I said, he didn't do what he was trained to do. I said, when they first kicked in that door, he kept his weapon at low ready. They did not present himself. They just started screaming, get down, get down, get down. He kept his weapon at low ready, trying to identify the target to see if it was a threat or what. I said, the cops, though, using those SWAT tactics who kicked in their door, did not do any. I said, they did the exact opposite. They identified an individual with a rifle. Therefore, he was a hostile threat. Therefore, they took him out, and he was shot dozens and dozens of times. And if 
So, so much for America honoring its vets, hey? If they served the warrant in accordance with the Constitution, he would still be alive. There's no doubt about that. I explained that. He didn't say anything about that afterwards. What can he say to that? What did you do, embarrass him or something? What's that? Did you embarrass him? It was never my intention to embarrass him. I'm just trying to align him. Well, the truth I'm trying to get him to understand that little document that he swore no to, to uphold and defend. That's it. And I don't believe every cop out there is a bad guy. I believe there's a lot of cops out there who actually believe that they're trying to protect Americans, trying to protect life and liberty, trying to keep us safe from a very small percentage of individuals who would prey upon the weak or those that they saw as the weak. Me personally, I'd rather there be a home in every single there be a gun in every single home in the country, and everybody in that home knows how to use that gun. And the criminals will be like, you know what? If we go in there, they got guns. Let's not go in there. Gun ownership is a huge deterrent when everybody knows that. Well, let's look at Switzerland, or let's look at uh, what is it? Switzerland? Is it Switzerland? Yeah. <coughs> Every male in that country is required by law to be in the militia. Every male in that country is required by law to own a gun and have a rifle in their home. Not just a bolt-action rifle or a semi-automatic. No, no, their militia is allowed full military combat gear. Scary stuff, eh? No, but wait, it's not. Because in Switzerland, they have no crime. Because <laughs> the criminals know that behind every door is a highly trained individual with a rifle. And the next-door neighbor, and the next-door neighbor, and the next-door neighbor, because, well, they are men and men as well. They are trained to respond within a very short period of time. So if your neighbor starts hearing gunshots in the middle of the night, guess what he's doing? He's grabbing his rifle, and he's going outside to see what's going on. And these criminals know if they pop outside that door, even to get away, they're going to be faced with a whole bunch of armed individuals who are trained on how to use those weapons. And the funny thing with Switzerland is that the their Super Bowl, you know, their uh, what is the what is the what's the baseball the, the big game in the baseball in baseball what is the big one World Series the World Series yes thank you you know their major sporting event there is not football or baseball or a basketball game it's a marksmanship competition you see kids walking down the street with rifles. They have a different culture, though. But they have no crime, and their country is safe. They've never been invaded or taken over. I wonder why. Well, i got to say, back in the 1950s, when I was a kid and got my first 22, I could walk down the street with it in the neighborhood I lived. We could go out in the desert and shoot. Uh, it, it's different. I mean, something's gone. That was in California, too, by the way. We could... Uh, they didn't have anything about... Rifle had to be unloaded or anything. You could go. We drive out to the desert, go shooting, uh, go up in the canyons above where I lived, and go shooting. And nobody ever said anything. Nobody was concerned over that. But you did point out. You know, the the problem is their assumption that everybody, and this comes from the 1957, the or 67, the first uh, SWAT school in Los Angeles, that everybody is a possible bad guy except the cops, the Demarest mentality that was created. If they assumed that all Americans were good, uh, they could serve warrants without full automatic weapons, military uh, hardware, military equipment, military uniforms. Uh, well, no, military don't hide their faces, do they? Well, some of them do. Uh, they could serve warrants, and probably 99%. But then they took a job that put their life at risk. That was part of the job when they chose to pick up the gun was to, the, always the risk of dying by the gun, but their assumption that everybody's going to shoot them ends up in costing so many lives every year in this country uh, that, you know, if we want gun control, we need to take them away from the cops. That would. Well, you know, it's interesting about that point, and, you know, and it's alive and true today. Uh, you know, in New Mexico, I used to hang out with a lot of cops. A lot of guys in the Mexico State SWAT team. My brother's fiance was a, was, a, was a deputy sheriff, and they all said the same thing. They are taught in the academy that everybody out there is a potential criminal, their wives, their children, their mother, their father, their brothers and sisters, their neighbors. 
everybody is a potential criminal except them. Yeah, thank you. Where that creates men. a different, that creates a separate class of citizens within America, doesn't it? That kind of mentality. It's kind of like a Gestapo mentality, isn't it? It is, and what they've done is, that the SWAT manual, I had a copy years ago, and it read something like this, that uh, who are the bad guys? Well, it could be a disgruntled employ, uh, ex-employee, it could be an ex-convict, it could be, and then the, the list goes on, or even your neighbor. So what they did is they threw all of the non-cop people in this country, or non-law enforcement people in this country, in the same boat with the disgruntled employee, the postal guy, and the ex-convict. Mm -hmm. And so they shifted the line from any, uh, any culpability on their part for shooting innocent people because the innocent people could be the bad guys rather than they only shoot the bad guy. Now, years ago, as I recall, a cop had to fire a warning shot if somebody was fleeing from the cop, that he had to fire a warning shot before he could shoot at the guy, and he also had to feel that he was threatened, which means the other guy had to be armed. So the world's changed so drastically. Guerna was protecting his uh, home. Uh, he did not fire on them, as you said. He was determining if it was drug people or cops. But they saw the gun, and their immediate reaction was to start shooting at him wildly, too, because the pictures of the house show Werner was in a squatting position. He was on his knees or down low. Uh, but the bullets in the hallway and the bullets leaving the house were six and eight feet off the ground. So these guys are spraying bullets in there, creating risk for the neighbors. And it was probably fortunate that no neighbor was hurt. And that's the them or us mentality and the, exactly what you were telling these guys uh, is wrong in this country, and apparently they don't seem to get it. So, you know, something else to think about, there's only two countries in the entire world that allow their police, two free countries, let me rephrase that. There's only two so-called free countries in this entire world whose cops are allowed to carry and to use hollow-point rounds. Now, I don't know if anybody out there has ever looked at a hollow-point, the damage it does in a gel mold. In a, in a ballistic, you know, in a, in a gel mold where they test, you know, fragmentation and tra and uh, trauma that these wound, that these rounds cause. You take a standard, you know, full metal jacket, it causes damage. Yes. You compare that to say, I don't know, a Corbon plus P plus round, 230 grain, 45. And let me tell you, that trauma, the trauma cavity increases by six times. This is what our cops use to stop people, to stop criminals. Now, I'm not saying that cops should not be allowed to defend the life or those or the lives of the public. Just like I have the same rights. I have the same right to protect my life, my family's life, or the life of the general public if I see violence being done. Well, you but know there are. It leads you to think if, if the U.S. is only one of two countries and the other country is Canada that allows their police to use hollow point rounds on the population. Why, have it, why don't the other countries allow it? Well, the, I remember reading years ago an article when they wanted to start using hollow points. The argument was quite simple, and it shows the hypocrisy in law enforcement that any argument's good enough as long as you can use that to justify what you're doing. They went to hollow points because the Regular bullets might penetrate the walls and hurt innocent people outside the building or in an adjacent room or apartment. So the hollow point, by is spreading when it hits the wall, is less likely to penetrate the wall. So they still use hollow points, and they still use and that is a, you know five two six or uh, the you know the AR-15s. Now the AR-15s aren't hollow points, and as was demonstrated by the well. Waco and uh, Waco, they, the, the Davidians told me the bullets were flying through the walls, going out the other walls. They'd go through many walls. They were using AR-15s. Guerna, where they were exiting the house, they're using AR-15s, but the rationalization for the hollow point is to keep from occurring exactly what's occurring now that they've given them military weaponry to enforce the law. 
So there's a bit of a hypocrisy in their the justification of their bullets. Of course, you know. Now, there was something else that they commented on. Now, this was towards the end of the conversation. You asked if, uh, you know, I thought that they, you know, listened to them they were just, you know, giving me the yes-man treatment because they want to get the hell out of the hot sun in, you know, the Ohio summer. And this is three hours later, keep that in mind. This was actually about two hours and 45 minutes later. We still had another 15, 15, 20 minutes to go after that. So there was other things that happened after this comment. But they wanted to thank me for my time. You know, they said that they were glad they came out and they talked with me face-to-face. They said, you know, they get a much better read for an individual face-to-face. I said, I understand that. I said, I used to be a contract negotiator negotiating $50 million contracts. Body language will tell you a whole lot more. You know, 80 80, 80 to 85% of all communication is body language. So you get a lot more talking to somebody face-to-face. He goes, I feel comfortable with you. He goes, I'm glad we came out here and got to talk to you. He goes, you know, I don't... He goes, you know, I really don't feel that you're a threat to this country or to anybody's, you know, life or, you know, life or freedom out there at all. I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. Then he went on to ask me, he goes, but now, he goes, you know, Randy, you have a lot of contact with other groups out there, lots and lots of other groups, you know, we've listened to your shows. He goes, do you know of anybody who might be a threat? <laughs> So they tried to turn you, huh, Randy? They tried to turn me. You know, you get a snitch. And I looked at him. I said, why are you asking me that question? I said, you know, you're that government agency with a multi-billion dollar budget. You should know a hell of a lot more than I do. <laughs> so I do a radio broadcast. I said, I can't even afford my broadcast anymore, which is why I'm off the air now. <laughs> I said, it was costing me about $50, $60 a month. You guys do that on lunch. For one or two of you. I said, why are you asking me? I said, you know, you've got a whole, you got, you got a file on every American in this country. You should know who the threats are. You're the one who spent billions of dollars and have tech analysts and analysts and psychological profilers up the wazoo. I said, you know, you tell me who the threats are. You tell me who I should be worried about. He goes, well, if you had to, you know, have you, in any of your conversations with anybody, whether they were guests or anything else, I said, he said, you know, do you feel that there's anybody out there who might be a threat? You know, who might do something? I said, you mean like the Murrah building or anything like that? He goes, yeah, like that. I said, I don't deal with people like that. I said, the militia members I've had on my show, I said, for every one militia for every one representative of a militia organization that I had on my show, I said I interviewed between 15 and 25, and I chose one. I said not because they were, the other ones didn't make the cut because they were bad people. I said they just didn't fully understand the responsibility and the laws that regulated the well-regulated militia. So I didn't want to bring on anybody starting any old thing. I said I wanted to bring on individuals who actually understood our heritage who actually understood the actions in which they were engaging upon. I said, I don't know anybody like that. He goes, well, would you tell us if you did? I said, if I knew somebody was going to go out and try and blow up a building with a lot of innocent people in there, damn straight. I said, you know, I said, I don't do well with, you know, Columbine killers and Virginia Tech killers and things like that. And if I knew somebody was going to go out there and just start shooting up a bunch of kids, you guys would get a call. He goes, well, I'm not really talking about that. I said, well, what are you talking about then? He said, well, if you know anybody who's going to take, you know, action against the government. I said, again, you guys are the ones with the multi-billion dollar budget. You guys should be doing your own homework. I said, but you know what? I said, I can think of two names off the top of my head that I could tell you. I said, but honestly, I said, I believe that you're their handlers. I said, I know what you guys do. I've watched you guys infiltrate militias. I've seen you guys try to, you know, try to uh, prosecute militia members. 
And it was your age, your own agents who were suggesting these criminal actions be done. I said, the two individuals that I would name off, I said, I truly believe you're their handlers. And it's their job to disrupt anything that we're trying to do in this country because you see us as a threat. I said, now I've got to ask you a question. I said, if people like me, if what we preach is freedom and liberty and the Constitution and upholding the laws of the Constitution and upholding freedom, I said, if these things scare you, you have to ask yourself why these kinds of statements scare you. I said, you're worried about me. I said, but I honestly feel that if my government is worried about me upholding freedom and talking and discussing these concepts of liberty and the right to life and limited government and espousing the limitations of government that the Constitution created and promoting our own state constitutions, I said, if these kinds of statements and this kind of speech scares you, I have to wonder why. They had no answer to that, I take it. They actually they thanked me for my time. And then they went and visited a friend of mine who lived two doors down. They spent less than ten minutes there. <laughs> Well, I think they wanted you know, to get back home. The interesting experience, and you know, I've had my share of interviews with the FBI. And uh, one thing that's important to understand from what Randy's told us is, you're not bound to answer any questions, and you can answer questions with questions. Um, a lot of people become weak kneed when they're interviewed by the FBI. They're, they fear the FBI, the IRS, even the local police quite often, and. It's our country. They work for us. We pay their bills. Uh, well, actually, they borrow the money to pay the bills and send the money to people who won't work for a living, but in theory, we pay the bills. They are our employees. And the biggest problem we can have is to fear the government. Now, I'm sure these guys left you, Randy, uh, being more afraid of you than thinking that they that you were afraid of them. In fact, I would guess that if they were told to to go back and interview you uh, tomorrow, they would call in sick tomorrow to avoid... Oh, no, they don't want to come out here. It's the middle of winter here. <laughs> I don't keep them out the doors for another three hours. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the nature. That's why what's so important about this uh, the show tonight is uh, that people need to understand that uh, not to fear them. Take them on. You've got good arguments if you don't. You don't have to answer questions. You know, that was kind of the point. You know, I, and, you know I, I was conflicted whether I wanted to do this broadcast or not because I thought people might get the wrong idea from it or the wrong impression. And I want to reiterate what the purpose of me discussing this was. And it was not to be smirched or, you know, denounce any kind of government, you know, law enforcement agency out there or the police or anything like that. But it was to show what one educated American can do when they know what they're talking about, when they know that they're in the right, and when they have nothing to hide. And when they're willing to stand up and not just talk about freedom, but go toe-to-toe with those who are supposedly engaging in taking our freedom. You know, when they knocked at my door, I and they whipped out their IDs. The first thought that went through my head is, finally, (laughs) finally. You know, I wanted them to come, and I know a lot of people have said that. And I know of an individual who said, you know, he wishes they would come down, and as soon as they did, he lawyered up. I, I can't lawyer up. I don't need a lawyer. I do nothing wrong. But what I wanted to do, though, is just exactly what I said. I would always do on all the other broadcasts. I attempted to educate. I attempted to enlighten them. 
I attempted to let them know my beliefs and my stance. I attempted to give them a, leave them with a better impression of me when they left than when they first came. And the last thing I said to them is, I don't want this three hours to have been wasted. My time is important to me. So please, think on these things that I have discussed with you today and meditate upon them, contemplate them, research them. And if you feel that anything I have said today was not within the spirit of the law, within the spirit of the very foundations of this country, you call me back and you let me know so I can readjust my thinking. You show me where I was wrong and I will readjust my thinking. I said, but if I'm not wrong and you find that everything I've said to you is correct, I would hope that you would readjust your thought process. And that was the purpose of it. You know, the problem with this country is that we forgot we were the masters, and we forgot that with that power of being the masters of this house came responsibility. Our responsibility was to be well-educated. I don't mean being able to do calculus at 12 years old. I mean being well-educated on the very concepts and the principles that this country was founded upon. You know, we have a president who has refused to submit a budget his entire presidency. Well, the Constitution says he has to. We have congressmen that are giving him money hand over fist without a budget. It's their job to be that checks and balance to him. They don't have to give him any money. They don't have to give him anything. He's not the monarch of this country. We don't have a monarch. For all intents and purposes, the president is nothing more than a glorified foreign ambassador and the commander-in-chief when five very specific acts are engaged upon by Congress to make him commander-in-chief. It is not an automatic title, but that's it. And he's a checks upon Congress in case they make some law that violates our freedoms. He could say, no, no, no. This gun control act that you're trying to make violates the Second Amendment. It is a violation of your authority. You have not the power to enact this law. I'm vetoing it. That was the purpose of the president. Foreign ambassador, commander-in-chief when need be. But not all the time, not an automatic title. And he was meant to be a check against Congress. Now it's the old boy network. Well, you know, you want this, but I want this. So how are we going to make both of these things happen? And to hell with our oath of office, and to hell with the Constitution. You know, we spent money hand over fist today, and there's a, there's a story that you showed me. I wasn't really aware of the story until you showed it to me. And I don't know if this is the actual name of the story, but, you know, it was called It's Not Yours to Give, or It's Not Theirs to Give. And this was a story of uh, David Crockett. He was a congressman, correct? Or was he a senator? Representative. Representative. He was a congressman. He was a representative. And something had happened in his, in an area, was it Georgetown? Anyway, some area. There was a fire that happened, burned down some homes. He wanted to take money from the federal, you know, from the federal coppers and give it to these people to help them rebuild. And he was basically told that he presented this bill. You know, hey, let's put this bill forward. Let's get this money to these people. They need it. It sounds like a worthy cause, right? Helping Americans whose homes have been burned down by a fire that probably was not any of their fault, or if not anybody's fault, one person's fault, and a lot of people were affected. Sounds like a pretty generous, you know, sounds like, well, something that our government does today, you know, billions for Hurricane Katrina, billions for this, billions for that. So the money never ever seems to make it there to be used for what it's supposed to, but we'll just forget about that for now. What he found out, though, is that his constituents were much better versed on the limitations of government back then, and his constituents let him know, we won't be voting for you again. Because you put forth this bill, and it's not your money to give. Charity comes from within homes. It comes from within the community. 
It was the community's job to repair those homes and help those people out. And we've seen in America time and time again when bad things happen, good people step forward and they help out. But it's not theirs to give. You know, and that's the problem today. We are not those we are not those old Americans. The kind that David Crockett went out and met. We are not those Americans anymore. We don't know what the hell the government's allowed to do. We don't know what the hell they're not allowed to do. We don't know what the police can do and what the police can't do. We're afraid of people. We're afraid of our neighbors. We don't talk to anybody. We don't discuss anything. We sure as hell don't read any books anymore. And if we do read books, it's, da it's Dean Koontz and Stephen King and other crap like that. Not to say that these are crap books. I, I read them every once in a while, too. But I spend the most of my time reading books that strengthen my mind. And this was the purpose of that visit for me. For them, it was to find out if I was a bad guy. For me, it was to try to change the mind of two fellow Americans to get them to see the bigger picture, to get them to see their responsibility as Americans. And that's why I, I decided to do this show. You know, I'm, again, I don't want to besmirch anybody out there, denounce anybody or badmouth anybody or any organization. And I know there's a lot of good cops out there that believe in what they're trying to do. But they don't understand what the laws are, what the freedoms are. They don't understand that it's their job to protect and defend the Constitution against all threats, both foreign and domestic which means the rights of the people supersede any orders they're given. It wasn't to do that, but it was to show America, you know, it was to show other people. You don't have to be afraid. Be strong in your conviction. Be strong in your knowledge. Be strong in your beliefs. And stand up. And say, and say no, and tell them no, and don't be afraid to speak. Because we want to restore, restore, restore any kind of resemblance to a constitutional republic that we once had. We have two weapons, our mind and our trigger finger. I prefer using my mind before a trigger finger, honestly. And I don't want to see Americans dying in the streets trying to fight for freedom again. Our founding fathers sacrificed enough for that. Let's not do that again. I don't want to see an American Civil War Part 2 again. 600,000 died before. How many more this time if that ever happened? But how about if we educate our neighbors? What if during 1968, when they started to pass the... Hitler's Gun Control Act, and that's what the Gun Control Act of 1968 was. It was a word-for-word -word translation of Hitler's Gun Control Act in 39, I believe it was. Now, what would have happened in 68 if every gun-owning American went out, walked outside their door with their guns in their hands and said no? And just said no. They had to have their guns in their hand. What if they just walked out the door empty-handed? with a copy of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence in hand and said no. What would have happened? Time Control Act of 1968 wouldn't have passed. Well, you know, California runs all these, you know, gun buyback programs where they buy your guns off of you. And all these kind of states are doing these programs where they want you to give up their guns. Just turn them in because you don't need them. That's what the police are for. Call 911. If it's a stolen gun, see how long it takes gonna, them to respond. If it's a stolen gun, they're not going to uh, investigate the crime. They're just going to pay the two hundred and fifty dollars and crunch the gun. You know, but how many? Of the, but it's not just stolen guns, though. How many Americans are actually giving up, how many lawful gun owners are giving up their guns in these buyback programs? Well, 
I would say quite a few. I mean, they've brought a lot of guns in, but when you look at the number of guns in this country, it's insignificant. But the very fact that some people will give up their weapons for a little bit of cash is amazing. Well, they have uh, decided that government is the, uh, the teeth that will take care of them. You know, when the cops are taught the rules of deadly force, they have to go by the system called AOJ, Ability, Opportunity, and Jeopardy. You know, an armed assailant, a person armed with a knife, can cover 21 feet of ground and stab you two times in two and a half seconds. The average 911 response time is over 20 minutes long. Two and a half seconds versus 20 minutes. Keep your damn guns. <laughs> I don't need 250 bucks that bad. Well, you want to see if we've got any questions from the uh, listening audience? Sure. There's a call-in number. It is a toll number. It's not toll-free at the top of the screen. If anybody has any questions, also any questions that you want to post in uh, uh, the, the Chatango chat, uh, which is going on at OPF, uh, post to freedom.com radio, uh, type your questions in. You know, one other thing I want to state real quick while we're seeing if there's any callers in, I want to state something I mentioned to them as well. You know, when they were on the subject of militia, they asked if I was in a militia. I said, yes, I am. I told them I was a member of Ohio Men and Men Militia. That was a concern. I said, you know, I said, we have contacted our governor. Let him know if a need ever arises, if he needs to muster the militia for the security of this state. We will be willing and available to assist in the protection of this state's freedom and its sovereignty. I said, our sheriff knows us. Our local sheriff here knows us. The local cops around here know us. We have let them know if there is any need for us whatsoever. All they have to do is call. And as long as it is for a lawful purpose that they would use us for, we would be more than happy to assist them for the well-being of our community. That kind of took them aback. That took them aback a whole bunch, in fact. They didn't know how to respond to that. But isn't that what the militia is supposed to do, subordinate to a civil authority? That, uh, <laughs> the concept is part of our <laughs> Now, we, you know, we, I want to reiterate that. We let them know if, if it was for the protection of our state, the sovereignty, the freedom of it, or for the lawful, you know, or or for the lawful mustering of the militia for a lawful cause, not to repress people's freedoms, but to protect their life, their liberty, and their freedom. Give us a call; we'll muster quick. I mean, we are the men. We are Ohio Minutemen. They don't know how to respond to that. There's a lot of practices that were fundamental to this country that have been taken over by the government. Uh, one of the interesting ones that I ran across is deputization. Uh, sheriffs won't deputize people now. They rely on it, unless it's like Arpaio who uh, deputizes people that are make substantial campaign obligations and have very clean records. Uh, they won't deputize people like you and me to assist them in enforcing the law, which would be a lot less expensive than these military uh, the sheriff's deputies that they've got. However, in Waco, the federal government deputized the Texas Rangers, the Texas State Police, the McLennan County Sheriff's Department, the Waco Police Department, and I think a few others. They deputized them, and they came under Department of Justice control at that point in time. Uh, Maurice Cook, the commander of the Texas Rangers, uh, explained to me that they had been deputized. And so the federal government can deputize, but the sheriff won't deputize. So power can deputize power that's obliged to them probably by monetary gain. But the sheriffs won't go back to the old principle that a community is capable of taking care of itself. Uh, I know. 
we had a major storm warning up here, and I called, you know, my commander, Colonel Cross, to advise him of this, you know. It was the middle of summer. We had hail, big hail. Sky got dark quick. I live in tornado country. I called him up. He'd already, you know, people were already aware of this. He advised me that, you know, if anything happens, you know, Fort Cross was open, and that if we were needed, we would be rally, we would be mustering out from there to help secure the community from looters and things like that as well. Um, recently, um, you know, my captain, he posted out, he, you know, he sent out a, uh, an advance warning to us about a kidnapping that happened in our local area here, or a missing child report. And if it ended up being a kidnapping, he would expect us to muster if we were needed for it. And we were ready to go if we were needed for it. You know, that's how we look out for the community here. That's, that was our, that's the rule of militia, the security of a free state, which includes your local homes, your local community. You know, we're prepping for, you know, disaster both man-made and natural. What happens in natural disasters? Well, look at Katrina, man. You had looting and robbing and mugging and raping and murder. And the cops are going to help you? Some of the cops were doing it. Well, I get a kick in. This was the purpose this. of militia, to secure, the, to secure their community against any threat, both foreign and domestic. You look, if there's an earthquake in Japan, the television coverage shows everybody in the neighborhood going to help get people out, uh, move the debris, everything. And in this country, they put up yellow crime team, team, uh, team's tape and arrest anybody that doesn't have uh, LEO credentials or first responder, they want like to call it, that's broader. It gets to the ambulance people and paramedics and all that. But it, it, it's absurd that in this free country, I'm not free to help my neighbor if he has a catastrophe. I'm subject to arrest if I want to help him. And it does happen. Yes, it does. Sadly, it does. This is back in 1967. I'd just gotten out of the Army. My brother was on leave. And we went out drinking together. This is in Southern California. And when we left the bar... There had been an accident. Uh, a lady in a station wagon hit a power pole. The power pole came down, hit the front of the car, uh, another car, and the wires were still popping on, on the asphalt that came down and grounded. Uh, the guy that had been driving, had the second car, had fallen over into the uh, floor on the passenger side. So I opened the door. And he had a big gash in his forehead that went down to the bone, to the skull, but it didn't look like the skull was fractured. But I didn't want to move him too much, so I drug him out enough where I could cradle his neck and, or his shoulders in my hand. And as the, cab, uh, I, the circuit breaker started popping off, so we stopped getting the popping wires. But as the um, uh, crowd gathered around there, people were saying, uh, you better not help him. If he dies, you'll be responsible. And, you know, I'd just come back from Vietnam, and to hear that coming out of people's mouths was one of the most sickening things I could think of, that I was responsible for trying to help him. Now, a lot of states have passed Good Samaritan laws that protect you legally from what the attorneys have made illegal by suing people that help people and an injury results. But we've gone backwards in this country. Uh, we are not allowed by law to help our neighbor. We are not allowed by law to teach morality to our children. We are not allowed oh. by law to discipline our children. We are not allowed by law to, and the list goes on and on and on. And these guys that you were talking to are part of the ones that enforce all this garbage. Well, you know, something else we've gone backwards on. You know, the militia were necessary for the security of a free state. They still are. When something happened in the community and there was a, and there was the chance of looting, mugging, raping, robbery, things like that, unless you're mustard. I can't tell you how many militias I've talked to who their whole objective is if economic collapse happens or natural disaster happens, their whole plan is to bug out, get out of Dodge to protect themselves. 
at the cost of their community. Well, our next program is going to be about security teams, which is lawful, but it's mm-hmm. substantially different than militia and, and it has exactly. a whole different capability. Exactly. You know, but my point was, you know, if you're going to call yourself militia, you're going to be militia. Be militia. Yeah. With everything that entails, including subordination to a civil authority, whether it's your governor or a committee of safety, be militia. And know your rights. Know your freedom. And be proud of them. And don't be afraid of anybody, ever, ever. Fear no man, want for nothing, and be truly free. Do you have any questions, any callers, anything? No, we haven't had any questions yet. I think there was a, a, a something that was brought up, not not as a question. I had made a comment, and it went back and forth as to perhaps I use fear a little uh, more more extensively than well, I didn't intend it to be that that extensive, but uh, it was taken uh, more as such. But uh, l- let me ask it this way: a couple of questions, Randy. Uh, one, do you think after they visit you and spend that time getting le- lectured by you, uh, that they are going to come back and visit you again? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> they said they left with a, they, they said they left with warm fuzzy feelings for me. <laughs> Why is it because of a little fear or apprehension that they're going to be non-productive and just uh, perhaps be embarrassed over some of the things you might say? Maybe that, or maybe they stepped away with the realization that, you know, I actually know what I'm talking about. Um, I practice what I preach. Um, You know, my unit appears in contact with local law enforcement, and we let them know that, you know, not just law enforcement, local government, you know, state government, that we are more than willing and ready to muster on a drop of a dime like a true minute man should if the need arises to protect our communities. Um, maybe it was because I actually understood the Constitution better than them. Maybe it was because I told them that I am not anti-government, that I am very much pro-government. And I believe in our republic. Maybe it was because I told them that I do not believe in a revolution or another civil war. I just wanted the restoration of our Constitution and all that that entails. And I wanted the government to behave. That's it. Uh, we do so whether it would be Randy. because they don't want to come out and sit on my doorstep for three hours in adverse weather conditions, whether it's the middle of winter, where it was seven degrees out here a few days ago, and they know that they better come out in, you know, heavy-duty winter gear to sit on my doorstep for three hours, or the middle of summer. Maybe next time that they do come out, they'll come out in the springtime or the fall <laughs> to bring chairs, maybe a lunch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I think uh, I don't think they'll be coming back for another three-hour conversation with me. Well, do you think uh, if if everybody responded the way you did, they would kind of really not want to do these type of interviews anymore, knowing that they weren't able to intimidate people and force them to turn against their friends, which I suppose equates to them as feel good. Hey, you're turning in your friends. Feel good about it. But do you think it would be discouraging for them to to do this in the future? And like I say, well, the word fear, let's say apprehension, that they're not going to be productive in, in what they do. Well, if we look at their visit as an operational procedure, in any operational procedure you have, you have objectives and goals, correct? Yeah. Now, their objective was probably to come out and get me to talk or make me, you know, make me say things that would incriminate myself or to give people up. I did none of those things. You know, I turned everything back on them. They asked me a question, I answered it with a question. Or I answered it with an, edu- with an educational sermon, if you will. They achieved none of their objectives in coming out to speak with me unless their objective was to come talk to an individual who was highly educated in the history of this country, who was highly educated in the Constitution of the Declaration of Independence, who was highly educated in the spirit of those documents, as well as in the writings of our founding fathers and in the responsibilities of an American. And not just that, but in the responsibilities of an Ohio citizen and a militia member. Um, if that was their objective, then they met their objective. If getting me to incriminate myself or to say things that would be smirched, you know, the good name of Americans and constitutionalists and, you know, people, you know, 
freedom-loving Americans out there, then, and to turn on people, well, then they failed miserably. None of their objectives were met. Okay, we do and nobody likes to fail. Nobody likes to fail, so they know if they come out again, they know they already failed the first try. Do they, would they assume that it's going to be any different the second time? I'm not making it sit up there for four hours. You came back a second time, you're getting four hours now. Well, the last time they interviewed me was 1996, and they haven't come back since then. And what, the 17 years now? So, I I, I do believe it is discouraging for them. Uh, but, but you know what? I, I would love it if they both came out again, and they came out to actually learn more. I would love it if they actually came back and said, "You know, Randy, we were, you know, we." I sat there and I thought about the things you would say, and I'm not quite clear on some of these topics. Do you mind if we could sit down and talk about this a little bit more? I would love that. Love it. I might even make some iced tea for him, take it outside for him. We can sit out there and have some iced tea or some hot coffee or something. I would love that. If they want to come visit me for that, I'd be available for them anytime they wanted. Well, we do have a question from the uh, chat room, Randy. How, how did you and the feds part company? Uh, they said that they had warm, fuzzy feelings for me, that they felt that I was not a threat to anybody. They uh, were glad that they had come out and visited and gotten to know me, even though they said that, you know, it was kind of hot out here. <laughs> they said that they, had, that they had a good feeling leaving. You think it was condescending or uh, truthful? Oh, I hope that it was not condescending. I hope it was truthful. But then again, it might have been very condescending. It might have been untruthful. They might have just been happy to get the hell out of there and out of the sun. I mean, they had a... They were from the Cleveland office, so they had a good hour, hour and a half drive back. Another question. Were there handshakes, or did they just leave? They just left. I didn't... Sh I don't believe I shook anybody's hand for two reasons. One, um... I, you know, I did private body. I did private bodyguard work in high risk security before. I dealt with a lot of cops. They have this little thing called their reactionary gap, and everybody's a little bit different. My reactionary gap was a good three and a half, four feet. That was a space I wanted to keep between me and everybody else that I was talking with. Um, so knowing what I knew of past cops and my own personal experiences, you know, I did not try to break their reactionary gap. I did not try to intercede myself within that gap, and I didn't know what the area was, so I, kept, I, I made sure to stay back about three feet. I kept my hands, you know, where they could see them as well. Um, they had already asked me if I was armed or carrying anything. I lifted up my shirt. I was wearing a pair of, uh, pair of shorts at the time, you know, like cotton shorts and a T-shirt. Uh, I looked up my shirt so they could see my waistband. I turned around so they could see I wasn't armed. I think a couple times I put my hands in my foot, like I handed my, one of my hands in my pocket, my left hand and my right hand. But I already turned up my pockets and they knew I didn't have anything on me. But even so, I, I did not want to break their reactionary gap because I did not want them to feel uncomfortable. Okay, we have a caller, uh, Sleepy Salsa. I think we all know Sleepy. And we, if we can get Sleepy in here. Hello? There he is. Welcome, Sleepy. Hey, Gabe. Thanks for taking my call. Appreciate it. Uh, Randy, I just, I mean, just hearing that story, man, uh, I'm just amazed to finally hear, like, a really good uh, police encounter story. Um, I did have one question, though. Um, did, did you ever get the sense that maybe they left a bug behind? If they did, they had to leave it on the uh, sidewalk out front because that's where I talked to them at. They didn't get anywhere near my door. They didn't get anywhere near my... They didn't get within three and a half feet of a wall. So they left something behind, and I stayed outside while they left, and I stayed outside while they went two doors down to talk to my neighbor, who is, you know, who's, who's in my unit. I stayed outside while they talked to him for a couple of minutes, and then I kept popping back outside every couple of minutes to make sure that they were gone, you know, to see if they were gone. And they didn't approach my door, and everything they did, 
like I said, there was my front door where you enter, and then I got like a four-foot breezeway area there that was basically like a big storage area, and then my actual front door. Uh, as soon as I closed my door and they walked off, my door was locked. So there was no way they could even get something inside of there. Okay, um, I don't know if this was covered yet, but uh, or broached. But did you see like any? <laughs> I don't know a nicer way to put this, but like any sort of, you know, big black vans or big white vans or anything like that nearby. No, I didn't say anything like that. Uh, I, I was living in an apartment at the time, and I was actually behind this big house. So a lot of my view was blocked, so I didn't see anything, you know. And the main street, you can't park on the main on uh, Locust. I live, I live on a. Uh, I know there's a main street that I think, and there's another side road there. They could have parked there, but I really wanted to see much from there either. But I did see a vehicle. It looked like your standard, you know, Crown Vic out there or, you know, some other, uh, uh, what's that other one that they used? The Buick? No, not the Buick. Is it a Buick? I think it is, if I remember correctly, yeah. I think it was a Crown Vic they had, though, Crown Victoria. Because I saw a black one out there. Maybe it was a dark blue. Hard to tell with the sun glowing and stuff like that. Plus, I need glasses, and I didn't have my glasses on at the time because there was a catfish in the middle of the pond, on the bottom of the pond that's wearing my glasses because I was out during the training and we were out messing around, and I ended up jumping in the pond trying to race a couple of young bucks and show them, you know, just because you're young, you still aren't with them, you know, in a swimming race. <laughs> so I lost my glasses in the pond. There's a catfish at the bottom of the pond wearing my glasses now. Okay, well... No, I didn't, see any, I didn't see any, you know, scary black vans. I didn't see anything like that. You know, I did do a sweep of the area afterwards, you know. Um, it's called a paranoia on my side, you know, but uh, I went looking around for, you know, vans and things like that, you know, Joe's plumbing that, you know, there's no Joe's plumbing here type thing, you know. I didn't see anything like that. Okay. Well, in any case, I'm really glad that everything turned out as well as it did, that it sounded like they came alone and the rest of it. And I'm just, the example that you give about how to handle a police encounter is, I mean, we need more good examples like that, because I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, guys, you know, screwing up a police encounter, act getting all angry or whatever. Next thing you know, they're in the clinker. But it's very good you're being a positive role model and actually demonstrating uh, really how to act, really. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, you know, my whole goal when they showed up was like, finally, finally, you guys have finally come talk to me. And it's about time. And I'll never well, talk to my friends with them, but they don't know about Randy Mack. Come talk to Randy Mack. And by the way, <laughs> you know, I, and I gave him three hours of by the way, you know, which is what I was hoping. I, you know, this is what I've always said I would do on my broadcast. You know, because I ever show up or, you know, any alphabet soup agency ever shows up, this is what I did. And, you know, true to my word, I did what I said I was going to do. I tried to educate individuals on what that Constitution really says. Betty, we have another question. Uh, were they questioning the neighbor about you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they questioned him about me. I mean, I was involved, you know, and there were several visits by people, and I was brought up many times. You know, I was brought up in all of them. Uh, you know, uh, have I ever tried to talk people into doing things that were, you know, into acts of violence or destruction or, you know, acts against the government? Um, have I ever tried to... You know, they think, do they think I would, you know, am I off the rocker? You know, would I be, you know, a, you know, a next uh, bell tower shooter type, you know, questions like that. You know, is Randy trying to encourage or in, encourage anybody to do anything that was, illegal, that was illegal against the government? Usually gets a lot of laughs because <laughs> uh, I don't do that. You know, I, I don't do that. You know, well, if you read, you know... I've never promoted that. I've never endorsed it. You know, I've always been a militia, and my duty is to secure the well-being of my community, to provide for the security and the safety of the people within it. That I take that seriously. I took an oath back when I was 17 in the state of Nevada. I took another one here on July 4th in Ohio in 2012. I take that seriously. I waited intentionally till July 4th to take my oath. I could have taken it back in June. And when I just popped in, you know, when I hopped across the border, I'm a border cricket. I jumped back across. I ran south for the border <laughs> from Canada. And I landed here in Ohio, and I waited till July 4th to take my oath. 
Um, the date was important to me. I took my old pen, and I, I take it seriously. You know? So well, the, I'm not out the, there encouraging people to do things that they shouldn't be doing. I encourage people to train, be prepared, to educate themselves, and to, tra- and to educate their young, their children, educate their community. I, this is what I encourage. Well, it seems one of the uh, the common things is to ask other people if somebody they know is the violent sort. Now, this goes back to 93 with me. Uh, uh, the lady that I knew in, in the Washington, Arlington area had called me after I got back to Florida from Waco, and she said, I can't, the BATF came and they were asking questions about you. And I said, uh, I asked her what questions, and she said, well, I, I, I can't tell you, but then she sent me a fax. I had another fax line while we were talking, and she thought that they wouldn't be able to read the facts, but they asked if you were dangerous, is what the facts said. And uh, that that seems to be the theme. They want you to be a psychoanalyst and determine if somebody's dangerous or not. Perhaps if enough people think you are, they think that they might have the foundation to get a warrant. I don't know what it is. but Well, if they plan to see the doubt. Pardon? Well, if they plant the seed of doubt about you, well, why would they be asking you if he isn't? That could be their, their objective, too. That, that seems, that's a theme, it's a theme that I've seen for 20 years now. Uh, that they, they all or, you know, if they figure if they're asking questions about you, maybe people will be scared enough to just stay away from you, to ostracize that, you. That, that could be, too. Uh, it's very possible, but that is the theme that's always... There, I think uh, Randy Weaver. When you look into what you know, some of the things they were trying to get him to do, they were also asking him about certain players down at uh, Butler, Richard Butler's church. The uh, can't think of the name of the church right now, where they wanted him to turn informant. That they were asking him, are these guys dangerous? Are these guys? And I think some of the guys were probably already informants for the the government down there because what the people up there told me was uh, probably half the church was already informants. That Randy wouldn't. But, you know, they, they tried to, you know, get me to, you know, inform the, you know, Benedict Arnold turncoat type thing. And they got nothing from me except for the fact that I said, you know, those two names that I will give you guys, except I already believe that you're their handlers. Well, <laughs> that was a good, damn good question. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's all they got out of me on that subject. I didn't even mention any names. You know, I said, my colonel, my captain. Well, who are they? You should already have this info. <laughs> you visited them. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you asking me questions you already know the answer to? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's the thing. You know, they try and get, they ask you a lot of different questions. They ask you, they ask you the same question in many different ways. And that's that's something they're trained in. Um, you know, interrogation procedures is something that all field agents are heavily trained in, and that one of them is to ask the same question in many different ways to get you to trip up over it. Well, just you know what you're talking about. Yeah, they're, they're trained in interrogation and psychological profiling both, and I'm sure they're conducting both those activities whenever they do an interview. Well, that's what the, that's what a face to face is all about. Like he said, we wanted to get face to face with you and talk to you. You know, we can find out so much more about a person. And like I said earlier, eighty five percent of all communication is nonverbal body language. Verbal communication only gives them fifteen percent of the picture. They want to see you. They want to see if you're sweating, if you're nervous, if you're edgy or jumpy, or if you're calm. What you don't say and what your body is saying could be two different things. You might not be telling them anything with your words. Your body's giving them a whole different picture. Now, like uh, when I was asked if I shook their hand, that's body language. If I start raising my hand quickly up towards them, you know, now I might have. I don't remember. I don't think I did because it would not be in my nature to do that. But if I did, and I say I haven't, then I apologize for that. But I do not remember shaking their hand. Because I remember the, when I first showed up, I was going to stay inside my doorway. 
And I figured I had about three and a half feet between us. And what I was thinking is, that's an acceptable reactionary gap space. I'm not going to invade that space. I don't want them feeling uncomfortable. I don't want them drawing down on me or thinking that I'm a threat. I want to give them no cause to think that I intend to do them any harm. So, you know, like I said before, though, you know, uh, I thought it was a good conversation. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I haven't talked to a Fed in a long time. Very, very long time. Well, Almost 20 years. Part. If you if if you walk away from the interview uh, feeling, well, with the last one they did with me, uh, when I went back in the office, uh, a lot of the people in at Sage Engineering had gone into the conference room, which has windows looking out on where we were talking, and they were sitting around the table watching this whole thing. And when I walked in, I had a smile on my face because I felt I I did a good job. Um, but they came up to me, uh, three or four of them came up to me and said, it looks like you won the discussion, which, and, and that's just it. Uh, you know, if you don't give up any information, and be very careful about that because they're sneaky, but if you put it back on them with questions, as Randy did, that uh, you're going to walk away satisfied that you did a good job, that you didn't divulge any uh, anything. I mean, that's all secret information. You keep it secret. Um, if they mention a name, don't say anything or say he's a nice guy or something, but don't give anything up. Uh, you can really come out of it enjoying the uh, interlude by having dealt with them. Well, you know, they, you know, they asked me, you know, about like my unit and stuff. Well, is there anybody in your unit? I said, look, I said, my unit trains in CPR. We, in cha- we, we train in search and rescue. We train for disaster relief. I said, which well, includes many things, food distribution, water purification, things like that. I said, yes, we train with firearms, but we don't do live action drills with platoon movements and squad movements, things like that. So those things are dangerous. I said, you know, we've let our local law enforcement agents here know that we're available to assist them in providing for the security of our communities. We've let our governor know that if the need ever arises and the, and, the, and the freedom, the security, and the safety of our state is in jeopardy, that he is more than welcome to muster us. So we will answer that call as long as any orders we're given are, you know, are in, uh, are in uh, alignment with the Constitution of Ohio. See, that's what a lot of people forget. You know, we've got the U.S. Constitution, but that was just a piece of paper that formed a government that, that told the government, that created the various branches of the government, told that government what its authority was, and then it restricted a lot of that, then it restricted some of that authority by an amendment to it called the Bill of Rights. Yours and my constitution, if you will, are our state constitutions. You know, some people say the state, you know, the feds can't do this. Well, you know, the feds can't do that, but your state can. You need to know what your state constitution is, and we know what our state constitution says. You know, we we know. You know, they asked me about. You know, he asked me about you, you, you know, members of my unit. I said, you know, you guys have got to question them. You should have to ask me their names. You know who they are. I didn't tell them names. They want to know. You know, when they said my colonel, well, who's your colonel? You know his name. You've gone to visit him. I said, my colonel, my captain, my lieutenant. I I dropped no names. The only one I mentioned was Gary's because they were already asking about Gary to know who you are. <laughs> and they were asking me about you. And if I thought you were a threat, I said, you know, hey. I said, you know, I, I've never met Gary face to face. I've never broke bread with him. I've never sat across and drank a beer or tea with the guy. I don't know. I said, I can tell you what he tells me over the phone. I can tell you how I feel. I said, Gary and I don't agree on everything. I said, we agree on enough that we can have a great working relationship. We we agree on the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. We agree upon the spirit of what those documents say. And we agree upon the fact of what our founding fathers thought about what that spirit was. We might disagree on some of the players in that game. 
you know, I might think that this person did good and you might think they did bad or, you know, I, he was in violation of this or whatever. I said, but that's not important. I said, we agree upon the big things that we were all given, that we were given inalienable rights by our creator, God, and that no man can take those from me. No government can take those from me. And I am truly free. And you guys work for me. I say, you know, I mentioned your name a couple times, you know, when we were talking about it. You know, about uh, your 10 point, you know, the uh, theoretical, hypothetical, and analytical foray into could the founding fathers have done what they did back then today? Would it have worked? Could they have pulled it off? He said, well, there's parts of it that, you know, encourage us. I said, no. I said, there's not parts of it that encourage us. I said, he took what the founding fathers did then. Exactly. I said, now you had, not even the founding fathers, but the events that happened. I said, now you had the Sons of Liberty. They went out and they destroyed a bunch of tea. You know, they made, what was it, the Boston Harbor into one big teapot. I'm sure that pissed off whoever owned the tea. I said, but these were acts of civil disobedience. I said, any time that, you know, people are going to start engaging in this, I said, they have a right to civil disobedience. I said, the day you make my free speech criminal, I said, I will engage in civil disobedience. I said, if you criminalize guns, I will become a criminal. I'm not giving them up. Sure, so I'm not giving up $250. The day you make pencils illegal, I will become a criminal. <laughs> the day you make thought crimes, I guess I'll become a criminal. Well, let me say that if anybody out there has ever asked if Gary Hunt is dangerous, feel free to answer that, uh, That, well, ask the question first. Do you mean with a rifle or with a pen? And uh, when they say with a rifle, say you don't know. And if they say with a pen... Say, why are you here? And asking that uh, question. The pen is mightier than the sword. It should be. That's how it came about last time. It was newspapers then, but they weren't controlled by three syndicates. So what we do on the I internet... I mean, look at everything was, that Jefferson did. Jefferson worked with his mouth and his pen. Not once did he raise a rifle. And look how prominent he was. And look how, much, and look how dam damaging he was to the crown. And not once did he raise a rifle. He walked with his rifle. He talked about long, vigorous, you know, long, vigorous walks with his rifle. He didn't fire a shot. He used the power of his mind. He used the influence of his pen. You know, he, he, he used his pen to influence people in his mouth. Those oh, were Hancock his powers. Those were his strengths. Hancock and John Adams were <laughs> very dangerous to the government, and they never picked up the rifle. Uh, but they were on the potential target list on the road to Concord. I know, I mean, there's danger in a lot of things, man. I mean, hell, you know, I could get behind every wheel of a car and become a danger to somebody one day. <laughs> but as uh, Adam you know, said, it's, it's the revolution... Though, you know, I, I talk about, you it? know, practicing what I preach. And it was interesting. Uh, I've got a stepson, he's nine years old. He's in class the other day. And his teacher's talking about how we avoided the fiscal cliff. And Nikki said he put his forehead in his head and he's shaking his head. And he wants to just unleash on her. <laughs> I'm educating him. <laughs> Nikki might be dangerous one day because he'll be a free thinker. And he'll understand these concepts. <laughs> you know, but he was funny because his, his teacher was talking about how we avoided the fiscal cliff. And Nikki wanted to say, we're $16 trillion in debt. Which cliff exactly did we avoid? <laughs> <laughs> the credit card revocation. Oh, it was funny. Well, yeah, but that's where it starts. I mean, tens of billions of dollars went to General Electric and a number of other places as part of that package in, in tax benefits. So, oh, you mean big government contractors who build all kinds of weapons of mass destruction? Yeah, those that buy influence with government. Special interest groups. 
God forbid. But uh, back to Adams and Hancock, John Adams, in, in a letter to Jefferson uh, many years later, uh, when Jefferson asked him about the revolution, he said the revolution, that was over when the fighting began. So I'm paraphrasing him. Uh, the revolution was the change in the thought of the people of this country, which is what we're going through now. And that's why John Adams was one of those that was considered extremely dangerous. Uh, they had offered... Uh, amnesty to everybody except Adams and Hancock in one of the dealings with uh, efforts at dealing with George Washington for an armistice. And uh, you know, and it's two interesting you brought that up. Because, dangerous people. You know, it's interesting you brought that up though, because you you know we talked about that. We discussed that you know that very you know that you know that con you know that letter that was written before you know about the what what the revolution really was. You know, and I felt completely justified in telling him that this re- that there's already been a revolution in this country. When our politicians revolted against we the people, and we talk about the revolution being a change in the a change in the thinking of man, you know we used to believe that this was a con- that we were a republic. Now we believe that we were a democracy. When in reality, what we practice is socialism. And any more, more and more and more, all you hear about is what's the government going to do for me? People screaming for more and more benefit, more and more special interest power, more and more of this, more and more. Freedom is for me, and enforcement of things against people who don't dis- who disagree with me. We've had a change in our thought process, and the revolution has already happened in this country. The question is, can we restore constitutional government and take it back from those who are revolting against it? That's the question. Yeah. Yeah, as I pointed out in the uh, the plan, the rebels are the people who work for the government. They're the ones that are rebelled against the Constitution. And those that support them. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard on radio talk shows and, you know, AM talk shows and this and that. You know, even a lot of these, uh, you know, talk show hosts, you know, like uh, Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and all these other guys that, you know, Patriots flock to. And I've heard these guys talk about, you know, my right to own guns. And again, they don't seem to understand it. They believe that limited ownership is acceptable. Well, yeah, we don't want, you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, supporting everybody out there on a fully automatic battle rifle. I am because the Second Amendment says I can. It says I can own a battleship if I can afford it. It says I can have an M1 Abram to park right in my right in my garage if I can afford a if I can afford that M1 Abram and a space big enough to store it in I can afford it or I can own it. It says I can own whatever the hell I want. You know I wish I had one of my cards. I don't remember the exact quote, but Tim Koch, who was probably the biggest proponent of the right to keep and bear arms, he, you know he posted something in uh, which one was it? The Boston Gazette, I want to say, just after the Constitution was written. You know, he was founding father 1.5, if you will. You know, he was one of the new guys coming in as the other ones were, you know, as, as the country was, as our Constitution was just forming. And he basically, it was kind of like a prayer, you know, he goes, I pray that the power of the sword is never taken from the people, we the people, that all terrible instruments of war remain in the hands of the people. Because if it's not, we will lose our freedom. That's what the Second Amendment meant. All terrible implements of war. You mentioned cannon on the ship. Now, cannons existed all over the country. People had cannons to protect themselves from Indians if they could afford it. Uh, collectively, yes, they did. The militia had cannons to protect their stockades uh, all the way through the Civil War. Uh, you know, we were stockpiling cannons before the, before the first shot was ever fired because we could buy them. <laughs> yeah. We could own them. Of course, they were made in England mostly then, but then they started. we started making them here uh, when it became difficult to trade with England. But uh, I hope you all have learned a lot from this interview. Uh, it was like I said when I first talked to Randy about it. I realized it would be a good show, and 
you know, I've been through that mill, and uh, for those that haven't, uh, learn from this. This is an education. You can stand up to them. Uh, don't be intimidated. The most important thing is don't think that they have an advantage over you. Realize that you have an advantage over them. And uh, what else can I say? Now, the you have to be educated, though. You, you can't, you know, you can't argue. You can't argue your case if you don't understand the case you're arguing. Or you can't That's defend right, your case if you don't if you don't defend the case in which you're trying to if you don't if you don't understand the facts of the case that you're trying to defend. Right. You, you don't, don't have to make it three hours, but but don't go where you don't know where you're going. Uh, speak what you know. Don't take something that AJ says and take that as gospel. <laughs> <laughs> you might make a fool of yourself. Uh, yeah. Anyway, the, Outpost of Freedom of Radio will be broadcasting every two weeks. Next uh, uh, Feb- February, or January 21st will be security teams, and we've got a f- uh, some other interesting shows lined up after that. Uh, we are asking those that are able to, to donate 5 or $10. There's a donate button on the right side of the screen. It allows you to use PayPal or various credit cards for those that have them. And if you're like me, you just can't make a contribution because I deal in cash only, and we're going to have a show on that later as well. But um, uh, we hope you enjoyed the show, and we hope you'll be back on the 21st of uh, uh, January, and same time, same place. And uh, we've got Randy out of his hole. He'll be regular here, and uh, we have a, a team that, working together to get all pull all these pieces together and uh, we're doing it uh, hopefully to be a benefit to the patriot community now randy do you have any closing thoughts yeah you know uh, it's good to be back it really is i you know i've had a lot of things going on in my life i've had uh dealing with domestic issues here with two kids i was stuck in a foster home because of their father who had custody of them at the time who had, you know, momentary custody of them for a bit of time. Uh, those two boys are back at home. Um, finally got them out of there. I've got a nine-year-old who's becoming highly educated on these concepts of liberty and freedom. In fact, to the point where his fourth-grade teacher is talking about this fiscal cliff, and he's shaking his head wanting to denounce everything she's saying with facts. You know, change begins at home. It always has. It begins at home. You can't change your community until you change your own home and what you live. You know, if it goes, if, you know, we talk about educating our community out there, and you know, if only more people understood. Well, whose job is it? Who's if they're not being taught this in school, or if it's your neighbors who are already out of school and, are, and have not and have forgotten this or have never learned this? If you want them to think like you, whose job is it to get them to start to start thinking? along those constitutional lines. It is yours. It's yours. Start doing something. If you want change, change your home first. Then get up there and start changing your community. That's the only way it's going to change in this country. That's it. You know? Um, be prepared. Educate yourself and go educate others. That's it. It's good to be back. I hope everybody enjoyed this broadcast. Um... You know, if any of the agents that were here listen to this, again, you know, I would love for you guys to come back out here. I really would. I hope that you come with questions because you are seriously interested in understanding some things that maybe you didn't understand when we were discussing them, or you have more questions about this little document called the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or this Declaration of Independence. I welcome any and all serious questions. Or if you just want to come on and talk to me again, well, come prepared to stand outside for another three hours, four hours, whatever it is. Because like I said, you know, I don't let in, I just don't let anybody into my home. I don't know you. You don't get in. I'll be more than happy to talk to you anytime. Other than that, if anybody wants to email me, you can reach me at oh, I don't have Randy Mack at, at Hotmail or Randy Mack at youtreadme.com anymore. So uh, RJ Mascarenas at Hotmail. You can reach me there for now. If you guys have any questions or comments or anything. And other than that, I hope you listen to the upcoming shows. You know, it's going to be different than I, what I was doing before. It's not going to be the enforced twice weekly type show where I was running out of things to talk about, and many times it was just me on there. Uh, we're coming out with a different format. These will be like special episodes, special broadcasts. You know, as things arise or do we have things to talk about? A variety of subjects, and it'll be good. 
So I hope you guys yeah. listen in. Spread the word. Let others know. We're hoping that the saying is true. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we expect that they will. Uh, I think Sleepy is still on with us. Uh, Sleepy, do you have anything to say? You're going to be the host of the next show. Maybe Sleepy's not still uh, with us. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, well, I'm definitely looking forward to the upcoming uh, broadcast, especially the next one on security teams. That one's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, let's see in the... Uh, so, Tango, do we have any final questions or anything? It appears not. So, we want to thank you all for coming. Tell your friends how good the uh, Outpost of Freedom radio program is. And uh, we look I have a question, to real quick, before we take off. Uh, yeah. Downloads. Downloads of this. Are they, are they going to be available? Are they available? When will they be available? If they are. Uh, we've got to figure out how to do it because this is the first one that we're going to have in the uh, podcast format, but we will on this page come back uh, tomorrow afternoon and hopefully we'll have links up to download this. Uh, and soon we will have uh, about 60 of Randy's old shows available in uh, YHTM archive. We're still trying to track down uh, beyond 2010. Uh, and if we can acquire them, we will have uh, as many of the old Randy shows as we can possibly track down. If anybody's got any, uh, get in touch with uh, with me or uh, Randy or uh, Sleepy and uh, let us know how we can get them from you. Drop a box or <coughs> something like that, and uh, we'll get them up in the archives. We'll have links uh, at least to the new shows should be by tomorrow afternoon. Sounds uh, good. Sleepy, show, Sleepy is going to be the host on the 21st. I'm going to be the guest on the 21st. As I said, we have a team, and uh, the, we'll be trading roles, right? You'll be the host or guest, depending on what the subject is. I'll be the host or guest, depending on the subject, and Sleepy will be host or guest. And other members of the team, if their names come out, if they decide to come on air, then... Um, you'll be aware of who the, some of the other team members are. But uh, we've got a good crew, and everybody's working together to get this done. We figured this out, how to get this broadcast up. I'm, I'm sorry that it didn't work for the people on Linux. I hope we can find a solution to that. Um, some people had a problem with Firefox. I don't know that there's anything we can do uh, about that. Uh, if we can set up another link somehow that will work for Linux, we'll try and do that and make the link available. Uh, but we have a good team, and they're knowledgeable, and uh, so we're going to try and bring you the best. I'm back. <laughs> It's all good to be back, guys. I enjoy it. Thank you for having me on tonight. Okay, and uh, thank you all for listening, and you all have a good evening.